Thank you, Dickens. Uh, I see your first question is on my journey uh, as a reporter and transition to editor. Uh, I want to say I'm a child of the newsroom. I started off uh, in the newsroom from uh, being a reporter, a cab reporter actually. And um, I went to KT and Kenya Television Network as a reporter and uh, actually not a, cab, not, not a reporter but as a cab reporter, trainee reporter. And um, I worked for about uh, six months and I was confirmed as uh, a reporter and my journey began, that was way back in 1997 at the Kenya Television Network which was at the time based at uh, the Nyayo House 20th floor. I've got great memories of the beginnings of that journey because being a trainee reporter is the most exciting thing. It can be exciting and challenging at the same time. Challenging in the sense that it is a new time for you. It is many, many new things that are different for you. But ex exciting in the sense that you are always the person everybody is sending out. Whether it's a burst sewer pipe in Eastlands, or a fire in Gikomba, or a parent's day at some school, you are the reporter they will say, dash there. And they'll call you back, go to another assignment. It was very, very exciting. And uh, to me, there's something that that period did to shape who I am today. And what it did was uh, to expose me to the wide breadth of uh, information and topics and issues. I covered general news in terms of politics, crime, the beat with the police. I've covered uh, religious events. I've covered uh, sports. I, I covered so, so many things. And that is the exciting thing about being a starting uh, reporter. So my reporting assignment then uh, started giving me some very, very uh, good fruits. In the same year, I started off as a journalist. I became a finalist in uh, an award called Kisima Kenya Television Personality of the Year. And uh, there were three finalists. There was uh, Mukami Kinoti, who was a continuity announcer at KTN. There was Jimmy Gadu, who was an entertainment uh, host uh, still at KTN. And I was, I was also there as a finalist, the only television news reporter that made it to the final of the Kisima Kenya Television Person of the Year in 1997. I consider it a milestone because it did an amazing thing in boosting my confidence. Because as a reporter, the one thing that you constantly uh, uh, need is affirmation that you are doing a good job. And this comes from viewers, it comes from your peers in the newsroom, it comes from your seniors, the editors, and it also comes from the general audience that consumes your content. So 97 for me was a turning point. In 1998, again another major milestone in my life as a reporter, I won the CNN Africa Television Journalist of the Year Television News category, the first prize in Africa. And uh, that was on the 18th of March, 1998. And I got to travel. My first international flight was to South Africa to pick my award as a CNN Africa Journalist of the Year finalist. So that was very, very exciting. It was more than just a first international flight. Part of the prize was a whole year's travel to whichever destination on South African Airways business class. So here was a reporter, a young reporter, traveling for the first time on business class. And that was very, very exciting. To South Africa, picked my award. And uh, that was really another key moment in my career. I can call it the biggest of the milestones that were happening at the time. Because then it introduced me to the international stage. I started, my perspective started broadening that look, oh, a television reporter, not just, don't look at yourself as uh, just home-based, but also continental, and also a person that can perform duty anywhere in the world. That's what the CNN African Journalist of the Year 
awarded to me. As part again of the prize, I was inducted to the CNN International Fellowship Program that required me to travel to the US and spend time uh, three months, a whole three months at the CNN headquarters in, uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, I traveled again uh, to, 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 to CNN. Uh, very interesting year because in 1998, the American embassy in Nairobi was bombed. And so with my new passport, there was no place to get the a visa. Visa services were transferred to other countries. And because CNN was organizing my trip and uh, there was also multi-choice in South Africa, it was agreed that for my visa, I'll go to South Africa. So I had to spend some time there again to get my visa and onward to New York from uh, South Africa to New York and then from New York to Atlanta, Georgia for my uh, time with uh, CNN. It was a very exciting time and it introduced me to new friends, new perspectives, new people, very new environment in terms of how they do things, equipment, studios, everything was really, really exciting. I had a wonderful time as a fellow of the CNN International Fellowship Program. Then I came back home and the year was really going on very well because that was in, uh, in December 1998, came back home and again it was time to enter again the, the next round of the CNN Awards. And uh, surprise to me, I won again. I was a finalist in 1999, May, uh, in the CNN Africa Journalist of the Year Awards. And I was the winner of the Environment Award in the CNN Africa Journalist of the Year Awards in South Africa again. The story that won it for me was the coverage of, uh, of the Karura Forest. Uh, uh, it was an investigative story because I learned from a friend that there was some activity going on in the forest, in Karura Forest. He said he used to go running there, but he started seeing some equipment moving into uh, the forest. We've moved in, we moved in uh, with my cameraman Francis Gedai and made several visits to this place. We kept filming slowly. We kept uh, hiding in those places to try and wait for those people that are coming in to, uh, to actually clear the forest. And then we also went to the Ministry of Lands. We went to the city hall, trying to look for the documents of the people behind the clearing of the forest in Karura Forest. So it was a very successful investigative story. Successful in the sense that when people watched this story, which we ran on KTN, the whole environmental activists world in the country just exploded with Wangari Madai, Professor Wangari Madai, the late Professor Wangari Madai who became a laureate, leading demonstrations to the forest and saying not an inch of this land will go to, uh, to, to private developers. And that is how Karura Forest was saved. And I take great pride in the fact that my story, my investigative story was part of what saved Karura Forest and made it and left it intact today, a place where people uh, basically enjoy nature and, and, and go there to run and things like that. So I'm very proud of that. Now, with this award of, uh, of, May, uh, of May 1999, uh, things changed again because now I got another job offer to move to the South African Broadcasting Corporation, SABC. And I left KTN as a reporter to join uh, SABC as a reporter. Uh, reaching South Africa, they made me the Africa correspondent. Quite an opportunity because what this meant was I would travel around the continent uh, reporting the African story. And Surprise to me, it started with the Burundi peace process, uh, which former President Nelson Mandela was in charge of. And so what this did was, to all my utter shock, make me meet my idol Nelson Mandela in person. That was quite a moment. I met Nelson Mandela for the first time in Pretoria, the capital of South Africa. And we met 
and then left Pretoria, the Waterkloof Air Force Base, in his presidential jet, the same cabin. And uh, because he was becoming, he had just been uh, asked by the AU to mediate the peace process in Burundi. And so we flew with him. Uh, I remember in the cabin there were just four of us. That is Nelson Mandela, and I was sat directly facing him. And to my left was uh, Professor Jack Garvey, and to Mandela's right was uh, uh, was Zeldon Lagrange, his, his, his long-time personal assistant. So I, I remember that time that um, Mandela was doing was writing his book that later became, it's called Conversations with Myself. And uh, I had the privilege of actually seeing that happening because he was writing on full scaps uh, in very large, and I remember Zelda reminding him to write in large letters so that his words can be, can be seen. And he would write and place them on the floor and place them on the floor. And later on, that book was released. It's called Conversations with Myself. And I witnessed Nelson Mandela physically in front of me, uh, putting his notes together for that, for that book. We covered the Burundi peace process. It became a big story for more than three years from 1999, because the war continued, then the peace came, the transition from the military government of Pierre Buyoya to a civilian administration. I witnessed all that. And my reporting grew. My, my, my capacity as a reporter just grew out of experience. Later on, a year later, I then got into uh, a situation of war because I was sent to the Democratic Republic of Congo to cover the war that was going on there. Remember, it had just been changed from Zaire after Mobutu Sasseko was overthrown, and it had become the Democratic Republic of Congo under President Loro Kabila. I went to cover the war in the east, and I went through Rwanda by road from Rwanda to Goma, and then in Goma, I interviewed the rebel leaders of the Rally for Congolese Democracy, R R R R R RDC, RCD, and. Uh, after that, I proceeded to Kisangani in, uh, in a cargo plane because it's a war zone. There are no normal passenger flights. I went to Kisangani and got stuck there for more than 10 days in a war situation, uh, especially when Uganda and Rwandan forces clashed in Kisangani. And my reporting assi assignments uh, just kept growing. I ended up in Darfur also when the war was, was going on. I also went to Somalia when the uh, hurricane happened. Uh, I also went to West Africa, Sierra Leone. I did elections in the Gambia. I did elections in uh, I, I did elections in Nigeria. I also did the, the story of the African Union when it was transitioning from OAU to African Union. I was in Togo. Lome Togo when that conference uh, uh, was happening. Then we moved to Cairo, Egypt, where the next stage of that conference, head of state conference has moved. Then from there to Sirte in, in Libya. From Sirte, Libya, we ended up in Addis Ababa now, where the formal transition from AOAU to AU uh, happened. So cumulatively, that kind of exposure really uh, made me the reporter that I was. Then came my transition now to editor. The first thing that happened was my uh, assignment in South Africa saw me getting promoted to bureau chief and posted to Nairobi to start an office for the East African Bureau for, for Kenya, for the South African Broadcasting Corporation. It was quite a good experience coming to Nairobi and looking for office space, setting up the studios for radio, setting up the office space, very exciting as well. And also being able to start having the experience in managerial part of, uh, of, of, of business in the media. Then my other break came in 2007 when I was approached by the Standard Group while I was still working for the South African Broadcasting Corporation. I was approached by the 
SABC, by the, by the, by the standard group from SABC, to come to uh, work as managing editor in charge of quality and product development in 2007. That's how I came back to the country, having, complete, uh, have, having been out on assignment with the SABC for all those years. Coming back to Kenya, I went straight into the role of editor, managing editor. And uh, I crafted the plan for the coverage of the 2007 election in KTN. And um, for me, my style then as it is now is mixed where I roll my sleeves. Um, the reporter in me comes out. The, the, the presenter in me also comes out. I lead by example. I sit with the reporters. I also do the job when that, that requires uh, me. And in 2007, what we did was also to introduce debates. And I used to moderate something called Debate 07, talking to presidential aspirants. And um, that was my transition to becoming an editor. So from the time, that's 2007, I've been in roles of editor and management in media ever since to date. Let me start by saying it was a great honor to lead the Kenya Editors Guild, a group of absolute professionals, people on whose hands and shoulders the media industry in Kenya rests. My term was very difficult, I must say. Very difficult in the sense that the Kenya Editors Guild was at the time in a state of uncertainty in terms of registration because there was difficulty, a great difficulty in transitioning from the old team that started the guild to new officials. And even the chairman I succeeded had not been, did not manage to complete that uh, process. For me, the highlights as well were the difficult relationship, relationships we had with government. Uh, at least twice in my time as Editors Guild, television stations were shut down. The first time in 2015, 2016, when the digital migration was being forced down on broadcasters. Um, and we held at the time, as we still hold now, that commercial interests were playing a great role in the way government was trying to forcefully transition the media houses to digital migration. We had made a very, very reasonable argument that because media houses, broadcasters have invested heavily in the broadcast equipment and broadcast facilities, they should be given a chance as well to be the carriers of their own uh, signals. This was not granted by government because there was this obsession, there was this drive and zeal to make sure uh, that foreign investors, and specifically Star Times, uh, Pang comes in and takes over the signal distribution business in the country. We felt this was not the right thing to do because of the uh, sanctity of the signal, basically. Because how do you uh, ensure that the signal is not abused? How do you ensure that uh, censorship, enforced censorship, cannot be just imposed on you by, by a government-appointed signal distributor? We held them, as I do hold today, that that was the wrong thing to do. And um, we fought major battles. Media owners also fought a major battle and succeeded in court. And that is why, even today, there is an, a broadcaster's own uh, signal distribution uh, platform. The other highlight, of, of course, was the 2017 election. Very difficult time for the media, especially during the contested presidential election results because government became extremely sensitive with what is on air, what journalists are writing, what journalists are carrying on television stations. So constantly we were operating in a hostile environment. Officially government was hostile to media during my term as uh, editor, Editors Guild chairman. And this reached its height on the 30th of January 2018 when media houses were to be forced not to broadcast 
the controversial swearing in of Raila Odinga as the people's president. We argued at the time and told government that the decision on what, what constitutes news should be left to editors. That is what editors are employed to do. Editors also know when something is treasonous and they will say we're not going to carry it. But it is wrong, it is inappropriate that instruction should come from state house to say that you cannot carry uh, something because that amounts to in external interference of editorial processes. We held that position and that put us into a lot of trouble with government. We had to be out uh, in a hideout for, for about four days because policemen were supposedly looking for us. We also had to go to seek to, in court the protection of the court so that we are not uh, arrested unlawfully as, as, as was happening at the time. People were being picked in what was then uh, really extrajudicial ways of doing, of, of doing things. So those were some of the highlights. But I remember a fantastic team and uh, I'm grateful to the editors because they always rallied. They always rallied around the cause of public interest. They always rallied around the cause of good journalism, and they really, really strongly supported me. Without their support, things would have been really, really difficult during my helm at the Kenya Editors Guild. Yes, we we did, uh, we did because that was a time that uh, police were picking up people. And we had very credible information from within the police service itself that they were coming after us. Remember, they had picked Miguna Miguna. They had picked members of parliament, Tom Kajuang. They had picked quite a number of, uh, of people. And we were given very credible information that they will come for myself, Larry Mado, and Ken Mijungu. And because of that, we decided we're not going to leave the office. If they are going to arrest us, then they have to pick us from the office. We're not going to give them the opportunity to pick us from the streets or to come at night and disturb our families and pick us from there. So we stayed in the office and I'm very sure they knew we were, we were in the office. I think I'll point out uh, two challenges. One is commercial. The advertising space in media is shrinking, so media houses are struggling. And what this has meant is when COVID-19 struck, we have had a lot of job losses. We've had a lot of newsrooms laying off people. I think that is a serious, serious challenge that remains to date. Remember for more than almost, almost close to two years now, Media houses have not been able to run even the normal internship programs because of COVID-19. Media houses have also been operating on, on slashed salaries. There are media houses that, are, that still do have that 30%, 20% salary slash because COVID-19 and, and the changing commercial environment has made things really, really difficult. So the first challenge that media is facing is shrinking revenues. And the second challenge, in my view, is credibility. Credibility in the sense that media houses are facing competition from um, the ungoverned social media space where information is being shared without fact-checking and all that. And this is happening at a time when media houses are facing the pressure to be the place that checks these uh, facts. This has been compounded by the fact that uh, quarks in the industry are becoming many. You go to press conferences, you hear of press conferences or interviews that are conducted by people who uh, later it emerges are not journalists. So it, it, it's quite a difficult time in the media and I think those are the two challenges it needs to address. On the second issue of uh, fake news, if, if that is... Uh, the word I should borrow. Fake news is, is, is quite serious right now. Media houses should continuously invest in strong editorial processes because what audiences are doing is to come back to media houses, check whether the newspapers have said it, check whether television has said it, because social media alone is not doing uh, the viewers, it's not doing the consumers a great favor. Media houses will always remain the place where 
fake news can be separated from real news. I think editors should look out for propaganda. Editors should look out and act against bias. Editors should look out for and act against paid for news. Editors should look out for and act against news that is skewed in favor of one politician over the other or one political party over the other. We have seen this before, where media headlines, whether it's newspapers or television, are actually influenced externally and politically, sometimes corruptly, by people who exchange money for this uh, skewing of, of news. Let's look for objectivity. Let's look for sober coverage of news. Let's look for uh, proper uh, reportage that is fair to everybody and that is not skewed to one side. Because something has happened uh, every year, in this, every election year in this country since 2007, and that really needs to be arrested. The newsroom is infiltrated by political players who use their friends, who use their contacts, to wrongly convey political messages in, an, an, in a biased way and to disadvantage others. The culture we chose as a media industry in, that, in this country is a culture of objectivity where we will not side with any side. Let that be clear in our newspapers. Let that be clear also in our television news uh, screens and also on radio. Kenya Editors Guild members should attend the convention because we need to keep our institution strong. We can keep the Kenya Editors Guild strong by constantly congregating, constantly communicating, constantly sharing ideas. And we can only do this in forums such as the annual convention. And again, it's only once a year. Surely find time to go out there and interact with colleagues. COVID-19 was a special challenge for the media. It was like covering war, and war of a new kind, war of the kind nobody in the newsroom had experienced before. And it had all the challenges of a new thing, because we are all struggling with even basics. How is it contracted? How is it spread? So it, was, it started off as a very, very technical area. And so to me, I felt the media did a fantastic job under very difficult circumstances. How did it do this? The media did this by turning to the experts. And if there is a ministry that has been covered in the last two years so intensely, it is the Ministry of Health, Department of Public Health. We've heard a lot from the, the CS Health, Mutai um, Kagwe. We've heard a lot from um, acting DG, um, uh, Dr. Um, Dr. Who? Dr. Amoth. Dr. Amoth uh, has always been in those press conferences and all that. So this, uh, th this was a very, very unique challenge, but the media rose up to the occasion with the help and assistance of experts. So I want to really recognize the Ministry of Health. I want to recognize other players like AMREF, uh, the insurance companies, Everybody that really stepped forward to try and explain what COVID-19 is. Thank you. That's the last year. That's the last year. Okay. Thank you so much. Great. Yeah.